year is 1947. The atomic age is already two years old, but on Puget Sound, a vision of the past is looming on the horizon. A tall sailing ship coming home from a long season of fishing in the Bering Sea. For 50 years, she and her crews have worked under sail as ships and men have done for countless generations. Now, she's coming home from her final journey. Her name is Wawona. I think the Wawona is important to Seattle uh, for a, a couple of very specific reasons. This ship was a part of two industries that really built the Pacific Northwest, timber and fishing. And without a vessel like Wawona, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have thrived and succeeded. Um, and as a result, the city of Seattle wouldn't have thrived and succeeded. The Wawona is a symbol of a city with a rich maritime heritage. Salt water has flowed through Seattle's veins ever since founder Arthur Denny plumbed Elliott Bay from a canoe with horseshoes tied to a clothesline and discovered a natural deep water harbor. With huge trees growing so thickly on the shore that early settlers struggled just to gain a foothold, the first use of Seattle's harbor was obvious. Seattle built a sawmill loaded lumber on anything afloat and began shipping it to San Francisco. It soon became apparent, however, that a specialized vessel was needed for the lumber trade. In the 1850s, shipwrights in California began experimenting with designs for an ideal lumber ship. Among them was Hans Detlef Bendixson, a Danish shipwright who built 113 ships in Fairhaven, California, including Wawona. Launched in 1897, Wawona was the state of the art in commercial sailing vessels. Unlike earlier ships, she could sail without ballast. Her sail plan was simple, and she had a steam-powered donkey engine housed on the deck for hauling sails, anchor, and cargo. These features made it possible for her to be operated by a very small crew. She was crewed by a crew of only seven working men, plus a cook, plus a captain. That was very unusual at that time. Most of the other ships prior to Wawona's group of ships were square riggers, and they had huge crews. Wawona was bald-headed. Her sails were gaff-headed with no topsails, so she had very uh, few sails to handle. The steam donkey helped out in loading and unloading the cargo. She didn't have to put ballast aboard. She was a very serious commercial shipping vessel of her time, very leading edge. On a typical voyage, Wolona carried about 580,000 board feet of lumber. This was loaded into her hold through hatchways on decks and doors in her stern. Then more was piled on deck until it towered over the heads of the crew. For 15 years, Wawona hauled these huge loads from Puget Sound to places as far away as Hawaii and Australia. Most of her runs, however, were to California. She'd go into Redondo, she'd go into Newport Beach, she'd go into Long Beach, she'd go to San Diego. And at, at that time, there were a few piers, but I don't think many. So a lot of the times, I think she'd just anchor off, dump the stuff in the water, it would get dragged onto the beach, donkeys would come and, you know, away it went. It was fairly primitive. When Wawona's owner, William Carson, died in 1912, steamships had all but replaced sailing vessels in the lumber trade. Wawona was sold to Robinson Fisheries of Anacortes, Washington for $8,000. Equipped with dory boats imported from New England, quarters for 40 fishermen, a new galley and facilities for cleaning and salting fish, Wawona began yearly voyages to the Bering Sea to fish for cod. Her first captain as a fishing vessel was Charles Foss, a colorful character who died at the wheel while steering her through a dangerous passage and was buried on the Alaskan shore. Fishing the Bering Sea in those years was brutal business. Working alone in a 16-foot dory, each fisherman used oars and a sail to reach stations often miles from the ship then used hand lines to bring in his catch. 
In later years, outboard motors were installed in the dories, and one fisherman found a surprising use for his motor. Apparently, this doryman was out one day. Fog came in, and he couldn't find the ship. The anchor that he had wasn't much, so he, he unscrewed his outboard motor off this motor mount, took the ignition plate off, tied his anchor line around the motor, and chucked it overboard, got it secure on some rocks down below, spent the night with a whole bunch of codfish, woke up the next day, it cleared up, he hauled up that anchor, wiped it off, put the ignition plate back up, mounted it, started it right up, and went and found the ship. Other concessions to technology were made gradually aboard Wawona, including a gasoline engine to replace her steam donkey, as well as electric lighting and a radio. One of her radio operators, Donald McInturf, kept a diary of his experiences aboard Wawona in 1936. The diary has lots of fun little anecdotes and some pretty vivid descriptions of the hardships and uh, the dangers. On the humorous side, I have my favorite uh, quote from the diary, which has to do with seafood. Fish, fish, fish in the water, on the deck, on the table, and in your stomachs. In my opinion, there is nothing deader than a dead fish. And to see a checker full of them with those bug eyes kind of kills one's enthusiasm for seafood. Wawona was still fishing under sail when World War II arrived. Then, like many Americans, she did her patriotic duty. The Army took her and made her into a barge, and the way they made her into a barge was a chainsaw. Came right down through this part right here, cut the bow spread off, half of the bow, went along the deck, cut the rigs off, tossed them away. She would take parts up to Alaska, and then would be filled full of uh, yellow cedar, brought back down from Alaska, and that, that wood would go into the airplane wings of the, the fighters being built at Boeing. When the war ended, Wawona returned to fishing with a new bowsprit and new masts installed. By then, however, the demand for salt cod had waned, and few men were still willing to subject themselves to the rigors of a sailing ship. In 1947, Wawona sailed home from her final fishing voyage. In 30 years, she had brought home a total of almost 7 million cod, a world record that still stands today. After her retirement from fishing, Wawona was towed from place to place and passed through several owners with plans to put her back in service. I understand one scheme was to use the ship to deliver cattle to Russia. I know that movie actor Gary Cooper and a uh, Montana rancher uh, had a scheme to uh, sail the ship with an all-girl crew. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what was behind all that, but uh, it never did happen. Um, in the early 60s, uh, a group uh, of civic leaders in Seattle that uh, consisted of uh, uh, Kay Bullitt and Wing Luke and Ivor Haglund, the restaurateur, uh, formed an organization called Save Our Ships. And uh, Save Our Ships uh, initial acquisition was the Wawona. In time, Save Our Ships became Northwest Seaport, a combination museum and restoration yard dedicated to saving Wawona and other historic vessels, including the tugboat Arthur Foss, the light ship Swiftsure, and the fishing boat Twilight. Staff and volunteers here have twice saved Wawona from sinking and have devoted countless hours to restoring her with the dream of seeing her sail again. Thanks to their efforts, Wawona was the first vessel ever to be recognized by the United States Department of the Interior as a national historic place. Today, Wawona plays host to concerts, reunions of her fishing crews, and to visitors from around the world. Perhaps the most important among her visitors are the children. It's rather gratifying to see these youngsters come on board and kind of run all over the ship, even though they're not supposed to run, and, and uh, stand at the wheel and look up at the masts and, and just imagining that they were uh, on a schooner, and sometimes they imagine they're on a pirate ship, but uh, it's very rewarding. It's one of the things that, that keeps us going here, uh, and uh, it's one of the reasons to ensure that Wawona 
uh, lives on for their children and their grandchildren as well. It would be a shame to have the children of Seattle grow up thinking that uh, Microsoft and Boeing's was the extent of Seattle. Seattle was founded on, on, on the sea, seagoing ships and timber. And, and the fishing industry, and Wawona had a part of all three of those industries. I think that it's important to remember our origins.